Is your team not performing well? Is morale low and turnover high? Are you falling further behind the competition? I'm here to help. I'm your host, Shaney, and this is The Leadership Show, where business strategy and culture finally meet, and we make the long-awaited shift from rhetoric to results. I promise I'm not your typical boring leadership consultant, and I will help you get your shift together. Let's do this. Hello, Leadershifters, and welcome to another episode of The Leadership Show with yours truly, Shaney. And it has been a while, you know, hashtag 2020. There have been uh, a few things going on that have prevented me from uh, recording some podcast episodes. And funny enough, today's guest, Luis Gonzalez, who is a culture and conversation expert and a master facilitator with Fierce Conversation, this is our third attempt to try and record the podcast because first he had a kind of a work fire drill and then I had a a strange thing happen where the water went off in my apartment and I literally couldn't take a shower and I'm too vain to get on the podcast, you know, with a baseball hat. So had to postpone again. So third time is the charm, folks. And Welcome, Lewis, to The Leadership Show. Thanks for joining us today. Shaney, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, you know, one of the first things I want to ask, since you are a very senior level person with Fierce Conversations, and I think a lot of our listeners and and watchers are familiar with Kim's, uh, sorry, Susan Scott's book, Fierce Conversations. It's uh, been on the business bestseller list multiple years and, you know, on, on a lot of executives bookshelves as I've wandered into people's offices. So question is, what is the difference between a fierce conversation, a, 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 a candid conversation or a radically candid conversation, a crucial conversation, a difficult conversation, etc. I think uh, <laughs> great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I think they're all getting at the same thing. Uh, how to say what you know needs to be said, mm-hmm. what you really feel, what you really want to say, what's really inside of you that you want to get out there. But oftentimes we human beings hold back. Uh, usually there's some fear holding us back, fear of being wrong, fear of ruining a relationship or what have you. So I think we're all trying to get at the same thing. Okay. Uh, with fierce conversation, fierce is a strong word. Fierce is bold. It's yes. assertive. Uh, it's courageous, yeah. all those things. And so okay. those are the kind of conversations uh, that we're talking about when we say fierce conversations. Yeah, you could say it in so many other ways as you already did, but it's kind of meaning the same thing. Get out what you need to say, what should be said. Yep. Uh, and how do you do that in a way that enriches relationships? Got it. And just quickly without, you know, giving away the, you know, the milk with the cow, because I know people pay you a lot of money to come in and teach, teach them about fierce conversations, but what is the framework uh, in, you know, from an overall standpoint? From an overall standpoint, let me just start with a starting point. How we look at it is, this is a foundational belief that we have, and it made perfect sense to me the first time I heard it, the first time I read it in Fierce Conversations mm-hmm. in Susan Scott's book. Our careers, our companies, our relationships, our lives. They either succeed or fail, and it happens gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. Yes. So for me, that really landed like, am I being intentional in all of my conversations in terms of where I wanna go, what I, what my results, what results do I wanna get? What kind of relationships do I wanna have? Because it's either a success or a failure, and it doesn't happen usually overnight, it's a gradual. Yeah. Suddenly it'll happen, whether it's a success story that you're going to celebrate or it's uh, you miss you miss the mark and you're going to cry about it. So that's where we start. And then that leads us to kind of like the next idea that came to my mind anyway, is that means there's missing conversations. You know, there's conversations that were not happening that are not happening. We're not having. Absolutely. or, Or in my case, I'll speak for myself, unreal conversations. Yeah, you know what I mean? The surface ones. Yeah. Oh, no, everything's fine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because, right, people 
most people are conflict avoidant and, you know, fierce conversations are usually the, you know, constructive conversations, the, the, the feedback that you're afraid to give a coworker or direct report or even it up. I, I view managing up as a potentially fierce conversation as I'm sure you all do as well. But the funny thing is, it's like you can get past the fear and show up to the conversation with the right mindset it's, it's actually the biggest gift that you can give the person or the team or or the client or whomever is on the receiving end, right? I would agree. And how I pose it, if you don't mind my kind of jumping in, how, well, how I pose it to people that I'm training and facilitating this with and having this conversation with this, I, it's like, I just weigh it out. Okay, I avoid the conversation or I keep it surface. What's the result of that gonna be? What does that look like? Am I gonna be happy with that? And what does that look like six, six months down the road? Or what if I do master up the courage to have the conversation, there's a 50% chance it'll go well. I mean, it could go well or not. 50% right. chance could go well. What does that look like if it goes well? What do I stand to gain from that? And then I just weigh it out. Is it worth it going through this little moment of pain, the challenge of starting the conversation to get that result? Or am I okay with just keeping my mouth shut, keeping it surface and having the other result? That's kind of how I look at it. Most of the time we'll go for, you know what? It's worth a little bit of the pain to risk on that 50% chance of it going well. Right, right. And always nope, stand No pain. pain, no gain. That's right. Not just <laughs> true in the gym, people. <laughs> kind of like that. It's a, mus it's a muscle that we got to learn. I'm, you know, we're all still learning it, right? You get better at it, but. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things folks that, that, Lewis and I were talking about off camera before we started was how to apply these skills in to you know, the, the day and age we're living in where we think, we hope, we pray, we're finally looking to make some breakthroughs around diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, etc. And a lot of times people don't feel like they belong, not for overt reasons, but for covert reasons, like not speaking up in the face of something that is offensive to someone who isn't, you know, in the in-group, whatever that is. That's right. Yeah. So what advice do you have for listeners to help propel that forward and make some progress? Because in the past, it's, it's like, oh yeah, we want more of this and, and then nothing happens, right? You know, companies maybe send the message to recruiting that they need to source some more diverse candidates. And, you know, maybe if, you know, they, the, the needle moves a little bit, but, but ultimately because there's no accountability and there's no cultural infrastructure to it, right. it doesn't succeed. And so it's really these conversations where the rubber meets the road on making progress. Yeah, so, so I'm so curious to hear what you're advising clients right now. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm advising clients. Number one, the conversations need to happen. So let's go way back and start there. Um, everyone, and I, I hate to use, um, what do you call those kind of words? Painting the wide brush. Uh, oh, right. Generalizations. Generalizations or absolute uh, terms. Uh, but everyone, anecdotally, 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 anecdotally speaking from my experience lately, this is a challenge for everyone from all sides. Okay. Yes. It's difficult for me as perhaps the member of a group who has been marginalized. It's difficult for me to open up about it, to just talk about it with my colleagues. Why should we do that? Well, because we want good relationships. That's another discussion about, you know, the value of having good relationships yep. with the people you work with. But then there's also the fear of speaking up that, you know what, the corporate speak, the corporate line is diversity and inclusion and let's make, you know, and all of that. But I've just seen five people get hired and five people who were hired after me have been promoted and they're not very diverse looking what's going on here. There's hesitation on that side of it as well to even have that conversation, what to speak of just talking about the issues that are bubbling up, you know, in the surface of conversations in the public arena. Right. So we have that. Then we have people who maybe come from other groups, let's say group X, that's not so marginalized or more the majority or whatever. They're not experiencing those pain points that some of the other people are. 
and they're feeling some empathy and they want to talk about it and, and they want to say that uh, I feel your pain or whatever, you know, they somehow or other want to show some empathy and make the connection, but they're afraid to say the wrong thing. They're afraid to put their foot in their mouth or afraid to maybe say the wrong thing and be labeled something. So there's all this, this hesitation and yet turn on the news right now and it won't take you but a few seconds to see that this is a uh, top of conversation in the public arena in the US and Absolutely. now even globally in some places. So the conversation needs to happen. I would, the second recommendation I have is, and that wasn't even a recommendation, that was just a, an observation. The recommendation sure. I have is to start the conversation is start by getting curious. Don't go into a conversation ready to share your point of view or show how you see it or share yeah. your experiences. It has been my experience and we firmly believe this at Fierce is to go in with curiosity first, interrogate reality. First of all, interrogate your own reality on your yeah, own. Yeah, I love that. You know what I mean? Like, why do I want to have this conversation? What's the goal here? Is it to make myself look good, get an ego yeah. stroke, get some spotlight on me, or is it really to develop some empathy and to really listen. So go in, this is my recommendation, go into the conversation with curiosity first and really with the intention of really listening, mm -hmm. really listening. And then when they give you some information and you could start, a simple way to start that is, wow, tell me about that. Yeah. Tell me Absolutely. more about that. What do you feel about that? Am I hearing you right? You're saying this, this, and this? Show some empathy. That that sounds painful. Tell me more about that. Okay. Right. And then the trust starts to build a little bit, perhaps. Or maybe there are two people that already know each other. The trust is already there, but the ice is broken. Right. And then eventually they may ask you, how do you see it? And the conversation begins. So I'll, I'll pause there. Otherwise, we'll go down a major yeah, rabbit hole. No, <laughs> I, I appreciate, I love, I wrote the phrase down, interrogate your own reality. Because, I mean, Absolutely. honestly, that's really what it's going to take to have widespread change here is everyone's got to take responsibility for being more self-aware of what their own reality is and it doesn't make anyone's reality bad it just makes it unique to them that's right, that's right. and 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 you know because i think part of it is i mean sure i mean there's so much blame and shame to go around but the average person like you were talking about who you know isn't you know, is just sort of learning and trying to do the right thing. Like that's, that's a great place for them to start is like, Hey, what are my own filters based on my own experiences? Yes. And, yes. you know, and realizing, okay, the, the, that, that is what it is. It's a filter. It's not the truth. And it's certainly not anybody else's truth. So, you know what? And it's yeah. getting curious from that place that is, uh, is good. And, you know, the other thing that was, um, percolating in my mind, as you said, to really listen is how bad most people are at listening because yeah. so many people are listening to respond, not listening yes. to understand. That's why I have to follow up with that because I can say, go in with the intent of, you know, being curious and asking questions, right? But what'll happen is if I don't follow up with and really listen, people will go in with the questions and as they're getting the answers or responses to those questions, they'll already be formulating the next question or the response to that answer, right? Exactly. So just go in and just soak it up, be, be a good listener. If I can just comment really quickly before we move on, on uh, what you were talking about, a filter, I think is how you, how you described it. We call yep. it a context filter. We all have one. Uh, they're not right. They're not wrong. It's just how we interpret things. My reality probably might be quite different from yours. Even if we were to look out the same window, we'd have a different perspective on things, right? So yep. that interrogating reality, and I said, starting with your own reality first, let's say, for example, I decide I want to give Shaney feedback. I've observed her doing something that might be a little off. And so I'm going to give her feedback. Okay, stop for a moment, interrogate reality, starting with your own. Why do I want to give Shaney feedback? Is it to look good? How do I know she wants the feedback? Right. You know, uh, right. do I is have that more about me or you? Yeah, what about you? Do I have assumptions about Shaney that yeah. she can't do her job well based on a previous experience I had? All of that is interrogating your own reality, right? So that's yep. I wanted to point that out. I, I love that. 
Yeah, I was going to say, you know, you could model giving me some feedback about my really bad Kenny Rogers uh, impersonation on a prior episode that you said you saw, because I know that I have a lot of strengths and singing isn't one of them. Yeah, but you kept it real. And that's what <laughs> that's what we're all about, man. Keep it real. You know what? And you like Kenny Rogers and you like that song and you just went with it. And I you know what? love Kenny Rogers. You, so that was your context or your uh, filter that I don't have a bad voice or what if, whatever. For me, that was about 20 minutes into the podcast. That was the clincher for me that went, I can't wait to be a guest on this podcast. <laughs> so there you have it. That's right, because <laughs> you never know when I'm going to like pause for a karaoke moment. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's good stuff. I'm glad you have a, a good sense of humor about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's shift to, um, to, to the other big thing that's happening in the world, which is obviously the sustained impact of COVID-19, which is soon going to have to be called COVID-19 and 20 and 21. <laughs> Apparently. And um, you know, because there, there's a, a you know, there's a, a few different branches off off of that tree that I, I wanted to explore with you. So the first one is a more general one that relates to I think what you and Fierce do in general, which is about examining one's victim mindset. Because it is it's easy to be like, oh, everything sucks because of COVID, and you know, I don't have any privacy anymore because the kids are home and every. You know, and my spouse and I are both working at home and, oh, you know, I couldn't buy toilet paper, you know, whatever. And like, that's, that's not going to get you through the pandemic, is it? <laughs> no. And guess what? Here's, here's the funny part. If you really think about it, you're absolutely right. It sucks. Yeah. Wallow in it for a day. Wallow in your Netflix cave for a day. Right. But or then, or two, you know depending what? on how long you're binge watching a show. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a weekend. All right. I'll give you two days. But you know what? At some point, as you said, I'll say it in a different way. It's not going to get you the results you probably really want to get. Right. So should I go with that? Should I, should I continue? Because how I look at it is, you know, it's a mindset. Yeah. Right. And you're absolutely right. So I'll use me for a perfect example. I was traveling 100% of the time with Fierce uh, prior to March. Every week I was somewhere. I was home probably less than I was in hotels. And yeah. I loved that lifestyle. That came to a screeching halt on March 13th. I remember the day. And for three months, maybe two, uh, it sucked. I hope I can say that. You oh, know oh my God. You, you <laughs> can say any four letter word on my show. Thank you. I roll out the red Keep carpet for four letter words here. In the spirit of keeping it real. Okay, so yes, it sucked. You know what? I have jackhammers going on outside. I live next to a train. I'm in an apartment building. I got music screaming people. And I can imagine other people too have their, their oh, woe is me about all of this stuff, right? Yeah. But how we look at it at Fierce is this way. Okay, you're absolutely right. It sucks. But given the current sucky situation you find yourself in, what can you do, even however small, what can you do to move it in a different direction? Because yeah. it is what it is. I hate to overuse that term. It's so cliche, but it is what it is. Hey, you're, you in your, in your Netflix cave for more than two days is not going to make the situation any better. It's not going to make you feel any better about it. And it's probably not going to improve your results. That's right. Given the current situation that, yes, it's not pleasant, what can you do? to get a different result, even if it's that one thing. And if you latch onto that one thing and you do that, you'll find your mentality starts to shift. So the way I look at it is first of all, and I'm gonna shift this to kind of working with teams and remote teams. So if you're leading a team mm -hmm. and now they're remote and you guys used to, gals and guys used to be in the office, now everybody's remote and you're a leader of the team and you got People complaining, woe is me, and my husband's asleep on the couch, and the kids are trying to do work, and whatever. I have a headache from too many Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To be able to have the conversation with that person to help them shift from a victim mindset to an accountable mindset, mm -hmm. we have to be able to do that for ourselves first, to be able to model it. 
because it's my firm belief, it's a belief at Pierce as well, accountability cannot be trained, cannot be mandated, mm -hmm. people cannot be held accountable. It's a choice. It's a personal choice. It's an outlook that I decide to have. And it sounds like what I just said a minute ago, given the current sucky situation I find myself in, what can I do to move this in a different direction and get a different result? Absolutely. I say the same thing. You're preaching to like, not just a choir, but you know, like an orchestra. <laughs> I you say the same yeah. thing and, and it is, it's true. It's like, fine. You know, like we have to process the emotion, right? Or else it's going to get stuck and then we're going to have more neck aches and lower back pain and whatever. But like once, yeah. once we do that, we do it. We, and the, and the way to get unstuck and to do something different is to think something different first. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it absolutely is a mindset and, and, you know, people can say, oh, it's Pollyanna to always look at the silver lining, but if you choose differently, how's yeah. that working for you? And you know, I, and, and I, I get how you call it a silver lining, but I'm going to just downgrade it. I'm not even calling it a silver lining. It's a choice. Right. I can sit here in my Netflix cave for days and I don't know, do whatever it is I do. Right. Eat bonbons. Eat bonbons or <laughs> whatever. Or I can do something else and I'll probably feel different. I'll probably have a different result. Will it change everything? No, but it will change my current reality. It'll change my experience of my current reality. It'll change the way I feel about it. My emotions will change. Yeah. So let, let's stay on that because that was really the other branch I want, one of the other two branches I want to talk about was, you know, as a leader, how, you know, the variety of fierce conversations that you may have to have during this time is, is maybe even greater than in regular times because people are under even more stress and strain and, and so forth. And, you know, there's the fierce conversation around performance and accountability and so forth. And then there's other fierce, touchy conversations around, you know, mental health and, you know, cause some, and I say it's fierce because I think a lot of leaders, like they don't want to poke that bear, you know, but people, people are struggling and suffering. Yeah. Are you yeah. hearing that as well from your clients and. Yeah. Uh, especially now, um, uh, you've heard probably the buzzword going around zoom fatigue and, you know, mm -hmm. I have to be doing webinars now all the time. Uh, and so what, I've been hearing from leaders that I work with and what I've been hearing from my colleagues who are also working with leaders uh, is that now that there's this emotional need to connect, people are thirsty for the connection and we're not getting it and we're not going to get it anytime soon in mm -hmm. terms of what we used to have, how we used to connect. And so the onus is on us, especially the leaders. Uh, we're all leaders, but you know what I mean? You know, the yes. onus is on us to, uh, to really initiate those conversations, number one and figure out ways to make those connections to address the emotional needs of our, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, man. You know, we're emotionally hardwired. We're built this way. We crave connection. So even now that we're remote, again, it's on us to make sure that we're reaching out. And the other thing I'll, I'll say that just came to my mind that I've been thinking about and kind of reading about as well is um, not the business as usual calls all the time. Like, yeah check in with your people even your colleagues when i say your people i mean you know up down and across it doesn't matter check in with them without an agenda yeah. turn on your camera let them see you smile a genuine smile because we humans can perceive when a smile is genuine or not totally. <laughs> so those are just small ways and yes that's the, the main thing i've been hearing is we got we got number one zoom fatigue but oh, i don't know what to say about that because it's going to be our reality for a while right uh, you know, but well, yeah, I mean, I think people just have to get creative about it. And, and I agree, it's much better to connect over Zoom or some other platform than to do things over the phone, but also giving people the, the opportunity to say, you know what, like, I do have a headache, I'm gonna, I'm gonna participate by phone today, or I'm gonna take a walk while I participate today, or just something to, you know, to mix it up, because, you know, people have to move their bodies and get out of these damn seats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, again, talking about uh, the fear or the hesitation of speaking up, that could be an example of an unreal or a surface conversation. What do you really need to say? I really need to say I'm getting a migraine and I need to like turn off for like two hours, but people will not necessarily, not everyone will readily say that and offer that and volunteer that. So for leaders in particular, um, 
again, it's up to us to check in and to ask to go in with curiosity, given everything you have on your plate right now, uh, what can I do to support you? How can I support you better? Is there anything you need that we haven't right. talked about? Right. And maybe they won't divulge it on the first conversation, but as you continue those conversations without an agenda, just checking in genuinely, then people will open up and say, you know what, boss? Man, I need a two-hour break and get a migraine. Please do. Yep. So let's move to, and, and this is something that not only the rest of the world is experiencing, we as consultants and facilitators who used to be on the road all the time ha are having our own challenges here. And so I'm curious what your experience has been with Fierce, because I know that training companies by and large like Fierce and, and many of the other top ones mostly deliver in person. And so yep. what's, what tactics have you all employed to, you know, keep, keep the, uh, keep the lights on? <laughs> yeah, it's been a journey and we're still on the journey. I will say I'm pretty proud uh, that uh, I don't know how to explain it, but in the moment I'm going back to March of 2020, March, April, when everything just suddenly got locked down and all of my travel was canceled. Yep. Uh, there was a month of shock. Uh, it was probably two months of shock, two months of, I remember, you know, not doing a whole lot of work and thinking, wow, I'm getting paid for this. And then suddenly the fire got lit up under our butts and we're like, we got to pivot now. This is not going away and we're losing, uh, you know, we're getting cancellations and nobody's booking. We got to pivot. So we quickly pivot, pivoted to uh, completely online. And then that led to more branching, improving our website and going now really putting a lot of our focus and energy on asynchronous learning on 3d web-based virtual reality little micro learning uh, sessions where people can practice oh nice conversations and so now i'm again this is a journey for me i'm learning as i go along there's so many ways and so many modalities where learning can happen online and it's not just always on zoom asynchronous okay go read this when you have time and watch that video, when you have time, when the kids are yeah. asleep, then we'll get on a webinar in the morning for two hours. Okay, a little bit of Zoom overload, all right, but it's only two hours. And then go practice the conversation, uh, you know, in a virtual reality scenario with bots that are gonna have that conversation with you. Right. So it's really exciting yeah. stuff. We're on barely on the cusp of uh, the possibilities to come. And unfortunately, as you and I were talking about, it doesn't sound like COVID's going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am, I am uh, heads down on this, on how we can continue to make this effective and engaging. And yes. that's, not only that, that's important, effective and engaging, but that the learning actually translates into change behavior and action, you know, remotely now. Sure. Yeah. I mean, on that topic, it's funny. I, I love how, you know, things in, in life start to intersect. So I was, um, leadership project is, is one of a handful of sponsors for the ATD, a, ATD virtual conference right now. Um, and I was listening to one of the presentations yesterday by an instructional designer slash consultant. She and her business partner have, and then they've been working on this since before COVID, they've got a sort of a new approach to learning that they're calling learning cluster design, LCD. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I love about it is it, it takes the different ways people learn in the modern world and encourages L&D professionals to target all three of them because it, it's like the, the live in person was, was so uh, pervasive for so long and and sure a lot of companies have started to do some asynchronous things and online things but but still it's all been focused in this in-person experience and she's saying which I totally agree with that people are also learning on their own yeah. through apps and you know on their you know in their own time and they're learning on the job which has always been like the hardest nut to crack and so she was just giving examples of all the different ways that you can insert learning and really powerful content into all three of those modes. And so I'm glad that you guys have. And I wanted to mention that out. too. Yeah, you brought up something we just were talking about it this week. We have, uh, I don't know if I should actually say it or not, but I will. 
So we will have an app released. It's not released yet. So everybody stay tuned. I know I can say that. First. <laughs> so, so this is the beauty of it because when we were 100% in classroom training or 98, 95% in classroom training, we were doing a few webinars. Um, it tended to be, uh, you know, we would leave a, a, a workshop a day later, after a day or after two days. And maybe I'd stay in contact with them and give them any support they needed a few weeks after that. But eventually you don't hear from them anymore and people eventually go back to the, you know, the old way that they were doing things sure. a lot of times, right? So now with all of these different methods that you just mentioned, including the app, man, everybody's got a cell phone and they're sitting on a bus or they're, you know, they've got free time. They're like, I need to have that confrontation conversation with Shaney and I'm nervous about it. I'm going to her house right now. Let me let me get a refresher right here on the app. And so now in a moment at any time, 24 hours a day from anything that's connected to the internet, you can get this information at your fingertips and practice it and get ready for the conversation. So to me, that translates into what I was saying a minute ago, the, the behavior change. That, right. That I love that. So it sounds like at the end of the day, which is also a cliche, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that at the end of the day falls under those like way too frequently used business cliches. Sorry, I hate those. And I, usually I know, I know, them. I know, me too, I know. <laughs> but, I stand at the end of the day. But it, it, it sounds like on that, that, you, that fierce is really, this has been kind of a good thing because it's going to position you to make a bigger impact through the different modalities that you've developed as a result of having no alternative. To, uh, yeah, absolutely. We've always said we wanted to make an impact on the world and bring fierce conversations. It's so needed out there. Um, but I will say, um, yeah, this whole turn of events in this year, 2020 has really, uh, again, to use that cliche, put the fire up under our butts. You know what I mean? We would have been yeah. comfortable you know what I mean? Before yes, that not happened, you know, you're sailing along and we're making sales and we're profitable and we're humming along comfortably. And now it's like, whoa, we got to be on the cutting edge. We got to, we got to think in ways we have never thought before. Think of things that we, yeah. So it's Good. exciting. Good. It's exciting. Um, you know, there's one other thing I have made a note of that I wanted to ask you about just mainly because I sort of, I, sure. I, like the term and I want to understand and, and what it means for myself and for other people too. Um, decision vacuum. What is a decision vacuum? And I'm <laughs> assuming it's something that you don't want to get sucked into. And, and, and so how do we get, how do we get out? Uh, well, decision is it decision vacuum is a, yeah. Decision vacuum is making decisions in a silo, mostly leaders. Uh, the higher up you go, the more siloed you get in a way. You okay. have bigger visions, yeah, but you're only seeing certain things. And so you make decisions in this vacuum uh, without hearing different perspectives, without hearing the devil's advocates, without having anyone really look at whatever it is you're planning, proposing, deciding, and going, wait a minute, whoa, there's an error here. Wait a minute, whoa, if you roll this out, it's going to affect our clients this way, and they won't like that. That's a decision vacuum. So how do you break out of that? Not every decision needs to be made this way, but many of them can. Whenever you're about to make a new, uh, roll out a new plan, roll out a new project, make a big decision that's going to affect other stakeholders, any of those things. Or sometimes you just think you have a bright idea, but you want to make sure it actually is a bright idea. Sure. Get a think tank. You get people, not five, six, seven other people around you from different departments, okay. nice. different roles different perspectives than your own. And I encourage people to grab those, not literally, but, you know, it, it recruit those people right. who, who you probably don't want to hear their perspective, get them and then share with them. Here's what I'm planning to do. Here's what I'm planning to roll out. Here's whatever it is. Here's what I've looked at. Here's what I think the pros and the cons are. What would you do if you were me right now and you had to make this decision? It's a little bit bigger than that. You might start off by telling what the issue is, et cetera, et cetera, sure. right? And then you basically pose it to them. What would you do? You get their perspectives and you still make your decision, but now you can make a better decision because you've had people poke holes in your ideas, find the weak spots. You're able to strengthen it. Uh, you're able to avoid disaster with a client perhaps that you didn't see. Now you can tweak your plan so that doesn't happen. 
Right. Uh, yeah. That that's fabulous because you know most people when they're looking for feedback on a on an idea or a decision go to people <laughs> from whom they think they're going to get agreement and and all that is is confirmation bias, right? Yeah. So we all when, when people that. tell you what you think they they think you want to hear, that's yeah. not actually helpful. So I really appreciate the suggestion to go out and recruit people who have different ideas and and have a, what might be a fierce conversational debate about yeah. you know from a devil's advocate but at least then you've explored the edges and not just stayed in in your own yeah. little and world you know who does this as an example and who does this really well they're known for this robert redford does this you know he runs his own organization i guess this, uh, i had no yeah. idea yeah, Robert Redford and uh, Oprah Winfrey. That doesn't they, surprise me. They typically open their meetings by saying something like, don't quote me, here's my idea, here's what I think we should do, here's what I think I'm going to do, here's my idea, whatever it is. Now, I want you to please <laughs> tell me where I've missed the mark, where I might be wrong, what you see that I'm not seeing. Great. That yeah. That's a politically nice thing to say. I, I would probably go in and be like, you know, here's my idea. I want you to shit all over it. Like yeah. not, not in a mean way, but you know, just to hear yeah. other because points of view. You'll, you'll know how to make it stronger. You'll see things. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. And again, I'm going to repeat this, but it works really well. I mean, we can use this in so many different contexts, but especially in an organization with a bunch of stakeholders on different teams, you know, if, if I mean, let's say if I'm in operations, for example, I'm going to make a big decision and it's going to affect sales and it's going to affect who knows who else. I will invite the leaders of those me of those teams to my 30 minute meeting and share it with them. And the interesting thing is a lot of times at first, if people are not used to this sort of communication, they'll say, you're in operations. I'm in, the, you know, what's what could I possibly offer and support? I'm not really sure, but I'll go to your meeting. Right. And then after the meeting is over. Everybody has learned something about the other people who are invited to that meeting about how they see things, how that decision is going to affect their department. That's uh, right. They have aha moments about everything that that department has on their plate that they didn't even realize. All of this happens, and the leader who assembled this group of three, four, five, six people, maybe for 30 minutes, now knows okay, I feel good about this decision I'm going to make, or I'm going to go tweak it and then roll it out. Right. Last thing I'm going to say on this, the best part is when the leader or whoever it is rolls out this, whatever it is, the project or, you know, does whatever they're going to do. And let's say it's an awesome success uh -huh. and three quarters later or sometime later, accolades come for that person having made that decision that was so beneficial and we gained so much money. They then get to enrich relationships further by shining some spotlight on the team that collaborated with them. Hey, I could not have made that awesome decision without the collaboration of John, Joe, Susie, Jane, and whoever else uh, yes. was on the team. Yeah. And then they get some love and it's beautiful. Right, <laughs> I mean, and it this really kind of takes us full circle to breaking down silos in that way, helps us actually need to have fewer fierce conversations, cross-functionally at least. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or or at least make it easier because I don't think there's ever a time when we don't need to have fierce conversations. Life would have to end, and you know, life. Oh, for sure. I just mean no. like when when decisions get made in a vacuum, and you know, sales doesn't communicate with operations, and so they're overpromising something that can never be delivered, and you know, so if more constituents internally are involved in those decisions, then those kind, you know, there's always going to be other fierce conversations, but at least right. the. Why did why the hell didn't you consult me about this conversation? Maybe then those happen. fierce conversations won't have to happen. <laughs> yes, yes. You mean you made this whole plan? You rolled up this new process and procedure, and you didn't even check in with us. And now we got to apologize to our clients because it's affecting the way. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Lewis. If folks yeah. have questions or want to reach you, what's the best way? Best way is to go to our website first of all. Go to www.fierceinc, F I E R C E I N C dot com. Go to podcasts. First of all, I want to direct everyone to the podcast page. That's where this podcast will be hosted whenever it's released. Great. And from there, you can also see the resources tab. We have tons of free resources. So it's fierceinc 
facebook.com slash podcasts. And from there, jump around, connect with me on LinkedIn. Love to connect and network with people that are into this stuff. So I'm on LinkedIn, Luis Gonzalez. Uh, it's linkedins.com slash I N slash Luis Gonzalez. You'll see how my name is spelled uh, in your notes in your life. Yes, absolutely. Real pleasure. Love being on the show. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you leader shifters for listening. And I hope you come away today with some additional skills and motivation to have some fierce conversations of your own, whether they're with colleagues, friends, family, neighbors, who knows. And, um, in the spirit of helping everybody get through this difficult time and making some progress in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and whatever it takes. And what, I, I'm going to go back to it because it's my one of my favorite things that we talk about to, talked about today was interrogating your reality. Meaning, and, and it's really twofold as as the concept unfolded was one. What, what, is, what are the filters, what are the lenses that you're looking at any given situation through and interrogating the reality of why you wanna have a fierce conversation. Is it about you? Are you projecting or are you really trying to help the other person, right? And so interrogating your motives <laughs> um, as, as you enter into these fierce conversations which have to be had, right? Period, full stop. So thanks for joining us today. See you next time. Mwah.